Uh, a very good morning to one and all present here. Uh, at the very outset, I'd like to thank All India Ophthalmological Society, the Scientific Committee for giving us this opportunity. We'll be talking about scleral buckling, buckling the friend, the next generation. So whenever we talk about serial buckling, there is a preconceived notion that uh, all the speakers will be very senior doctors who have been doing this surgery for past two, three decades. Whereas the younger generation, the newer retina surgeons, they have no idea how to do a scleral buckle and they have given, given up on it and they're just interested in vitrectomy. So today we are going to change that. This is a young master's course where all of us, new generation, young retina surgeons will be talking about serial buckling. We are very lucky to have with us Dr. Animesh Jindal. He is one of the sur leading surgeons of Patiala. And he is the one who actually put serial buckling in the radar for me. And I got a lot of help from him during our fellowship days in LP Prasad. He'll be talking about serial buckling, the conventional technique. I'll be talking about whether we can actually use serial buckling as the first choice for all regmatogenous retinal attachment, primary ones. Then we have Dr. Vaivav Seti from New Delhi. He'll be talking about chandelier assisted sleeve buckle. Dr. Divakant, of course, needs no introduction. He has done tremendous work for us young ophthalmologists. He will be talking why sleeve buckling has fallen out of hope. And finally, we have Dr. Avanish from IQ Hospitals, Guru Gram. He will be talking about sleeve buckling in pediatric retinal attachment. So guys, this is going to be a fun ride. Buckle up. I'll stop with the buckle jokes and we have Dr. Animesh first to present the steel buckling conventional technique. Over Thank to you, Dr. Dr. Animesh. Thank you, Dr. Himadri. So I will share my screen. So, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes. You can go full screen as well. Yes, I'm trying to do that. So, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Himadri, for giving me this opportunity to be your co instructor. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, the conventional technique of this beautiful surgery that is scleral buckling. Uh, scleral buckling is also referred to as a conventional or external retinal detachment surgery uh, because uh, we use a surgical material that is an explant which is sutured outside the sclera to uh, give an indent in the sclera so that uh, we can oppose the retinal pigment epithelium to the neurosensory retina and attach the retina. So, uh, I'll be talking about the various steps of conventional retinal detachment surgery. Uh, it starts with conjunctival peritomy. It is the first step and also a very important step because we have to do a very clean peritomy so that we don't have any problem in the end uh, closing it. And a good peritomy and a good closure prevents further infections, uh, later on infections, and also buccal exposures and extrusions. After doing a good peritomy, we have to sling the rectus muscles uh, or bridle all the four rectus muscles. Care has to be taken while uh, bridling the muscles, especially the superior rectus and the lateral rectus so that we don't bridle the oblique muscles also. The after bridling all the four muscles, the next step is one of the most important steps that is the localization of all the breaks by intraoperative examination. When we see in the OPD, it's very easy to see, but suddenly when we come to the OR and try to see under uh, intraoperative, when we try to do intraoperative examination, it's sometimes completely a different picture because you suddenly realize what all you could see in the OPD is not that clear in the OR. So a thorough examination of 
all uh, throughout the retina and uh, marking all the breaks is very, very important because that will define the success of your surgery. Once you have localized all the Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, Dr. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Audible, go so, ahead. Uh, once you have localized all the breaks, then we, uh, comes the treating of the breaks. The most common and most popular method is cryotherapy. Cryotherapy should be applied while observing the fundus directly with an indirect ophthalmoscope and using a cryoprobe in place of a spiral depressor. So uh, there are some disadvantages of cryotherapy also, like uh, dispersion of the pigment leading to PVR, a choroidal congestion and hyperemia, which can cause some hemorrhage when we try to drain the SRF. Also, there can be a breakdown of blood, blood ocular barrier uh, leading to cystoid macular edema and exudative detachment if we do uh, excessive cryotherapy. But a good cryotherapy in moderation is almost uh, doesn't have any much side effects. So what is a good cryotherapy? How do you cover it? You have to cover all the sides of the break. Like there's a horse, large horseshoe tear, so the anterior and the posterior border and the horns. And from the horns area, take the cryo laser till the aura so that there's a complete choreoretinal adhesion up to the aura and uh, it prevents further uh, extension of the breaks. A fresh cryo mark will look like slight whitening of the retina and they, it should cover whole of the break on all sides. It's very important to cover the break completely and not leave it on some side because then there will be inefficient choreoretinal adhesions. An old cryotherapy scar is mainly a scar and uh, you can hardly even make out break in that when there is a complete choreoretinal adhesion. Photocoagulation can also be used as a method of choreoretinal adhesion. It is delivered through laser indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, the advantage is that it has a very fast onset of action. Uh, the adhesion starts occurring within 24 hours and carries less morbidity, but can only be applied after SRF drainage or to the breaks in the attached retina. As we know, photocoagulation will not be possible even if there is small amount of SRF present around the break. So cryotherapy still remains the gold standard for the, uh, for the chororetinal adhesions in a buckling surgery. Then there are various buckling materials present. Uh, most commonly used are the solid silicon rubbers that we use. Uh, they can be uh, in the form of uh, encerclage or symmetrical and asymmetrical segments. Silicon sponges are also there, which can be used radially. They use, uh, nowadays, uh, they are not used that frequently because of the risk of extrusion is more in the sponge. Hydrogel implants used to be there by Mira, but they are now not available. Uh, they have discontinued uh, since uh, last 20 years. So mainly two options are there, the solid silicon rubber and silicon sponge. And selecting the proper buccal material and the proper buccal uh, implant is very important uh, also for the success of the surgery. Now, these implants or the scleral implants are sutured to the sclera. So a proper suturing is also important. So each and every step is, I'll say, more important than the previous one. So... We usually use monofilament nylon or uh, polyester uh, as a su uh, to suture the explant because of their properties like durability, biocompatibility, and ease of handling of them. The suture bites are oriented parallel to the long axis of the implant. That is, if we are putting a radial implant, then the suture bites have to be radial. And if we are putting a circumferential uh, implant, the, real, real, the suture bites have to be circumferential it's very important to increase to keep the distance between the two bites greater than the width of the implant because when we tighten the suture the sclera has to partially envelop the explant so that implant can create some indent inside the eye 
when we use a sut needle we usually use a spatulated needle that is it has a flat superior and inferior surface and sides are the cutting edges this decreases the risk of a perforation of the sclera uh, while a cutting needle uh, with which has uh, superior and inferior cutting edges can lead to uh, even the perforation so a spatulated needle is always better for passing the scleral sutures the placing of the buckle now is the uh, next step we have the placement of the buckle and the buckle that is required depends upon the brakes the buckle indent has to cover the all the brakes and other treatable lesions in the retina on all sides at least by 2 mm so if it is an anterior buckle we may go ahead with just a encerclage but if it's a posterior uh, if it's a posterior break and a large break segmental buckles are required now there are different techniques of placing the buckle uh, we can just uh, like shown in the uh, in the picture on the left side we can use just a uh, 360 degree encerclage a buckle with an encerclage or a radial sponge radial sponge with an encerclage so all these technique all these methods will vary from patient to patient depending upon the number of breaks the placement of the breaks and the size of the breaks so after we have put the buckle uh, next comes the subretinal fluid drainage now some people uh, they tighten the encerclage after the drainage and some people tighten the encerclage before the drainage i prefer to tighten the encerclage before the drainage so that complete indent of the buckle is uh, present inside and also the fluid which is in the periphery in the area of uh, buckle is pushed back so that it gives a larger area larger space for drainage so subretinal fluid drainage is a dreaded step i'll say because most of the complications that usually occur the most dreaded being the subretinal hemorrhage occurs in this stage some people prefer to do a non drainage surgery some prefer to do a drainage surgery what are the rationales of subretinal fluid drainage one it decreases the intraocular pressure and thus achieves a good buccal height also it reduces the subretinal fluid and facilitates the closure of the breaks so various indications of subretinal fluid drainage are if there's a bullous or a chronic detachment in high myopic detachments where the rp function is not very good in inferior breaks if patient is a non glaucoma then uh, drainage helps because it lowers the iop and prevents uh, the wash out of uh, the optic disc when no apparent retinal break is found these days usually we don't even do buccal surgery when there is no retinal break found but if you have to do a uh, buccal surgery in such cases then drainage should be done so that because after drainage the retina falls back the folds open and you are able to see uh, some breaks also and also if there are multiple breaks selection of the site of the drainage so srf is drained in an area where there is sufficient fluid to enter the subretinal space safely and this is the reason that i tighten my buccal uh, band initially because it pushes the fluid back and there is a further increase in the subretinal space it should be avoided in the areas which have been treated with cryotherapy because cryotherapy causes congestion of the choroidal vasculature and it also increases in hemorrhage and uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock positions have to be avoided where physical uh, feasible nasal quadrants are preferred the techniques are mainly two types the cut down method and direct needle entry uh, after fluid uh, draining the fluid their iop goes down and uh, there are few methods which we can use to increase the pressure because hypotony will cause decrease in the Uh, in uh, hypotony will lead to subretinal hemorrhage so keeping the pressure well is very very important to prevent the uh, occurrence of subretinal hemorrhage we can use either bss air or gas the complications of drainage we have already said that subretinal hemorrhage is the most common and dreaded and mostly caused by the hypotony after drainage 
then perforation retinal incarceration and of thalmitis are the various other causes now the advantages of scleral buckling in young patients especially where there is a crystalline lens and therefore accommodation is uh, i'm just finishing this my last slide now yeah, if you can come to the concluding slide doctor yeah Thanks. it's the last slide only and uh, it gives a 360 degree support the equipment is also cost is lower complications uh, we have already discussed during the presentation so uh, thank you i'll say buckling surgery is one of the most beautiful surgeries for the retina and if the uh, case is selected properly uh, there's nothing like that thank you thank you doctor to complete thanks a lot dr animesh uh, uh, i'll share my screen now is that fine yes dr madhu thanks a lot dr animesh uh, it was a great presentation uh, i'll be now talking about scleral buckling whether it should be the first choice for all primary retinal detachments i have no financial interest now scleral buckling was considered the gold standard for surgery for uncomplicated retinal detachment all along however there has been a growing shift towards pass pena vitrectomy a 2017 study showed that 83% of preference was vitrectomy while while 5% for scleral buckling in cases of retinal detachment now why this decline it will be covered in details by dr devakan i'll just touch upon a little bit upon it uh, the availability of small gauge instrumentation has made vitrectomy a great option also less time is spent on scleral buckling by mentors and trainee programs there are economic and time factors there is no industry support for scleral buckling and certain misconceptions have creeped in these include Uh, the misconception that scleral buckling actually has a lower success rate than pass pena vitrectomy has a high complication rate and a high rate of pvr there is no dearth of studies actually where it is shown that scleral buckling is actually as effective as primary vitrectomy not just in phakic patients but also in pseudo phakic and aphakic patients when combined with a pneumatic retinopexy the success rate goes up even higher there is also a cochrane review where 10 randomized control trials were taken and uh, a review was done and there was very little difference between pass pena vitrectomy and scleral buckling treatment uh, regardless of the uh, type of fak or fak status now in spite of that today the picture is that scleral buckling should be done only for young fak patient with no pvt so with this background i come to the purpose of this presentation Uh, it was to evaluate whether the indications of scleral buckling can be extended beyond a few selective cases and whether there is any relevance of this procedure in modern day practice uh, we did a retrospective study in our center uh, we included 73 eyes of 71 patients we included all kinds of retinal detachments primary retinal detachments that is phakic retinal detachment without pvd phakic detachment with pvd pseudo phakic detachments with pvd aphakic detachments and complicated detachments where uh, there was a very posterior break or patient with choroidal detachments patient with retinoschisis also with a fixed fold in one fold now coming to the surgical procedure this was a 72 year old gentleman with a bullous retinal detachment patient was pseudo phakic so we'll just touch upon the uh, surgical procedure one more time uh, as dr animesh mentioned we do a 360 degree peritomy followed by uh, isolation of the all the four rectus muscles again uh, hooking has to be very careful we then go ahead with the cryopexy and marking of the break this is done using uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy now one very important step is to actually mark the break using a, a sterile marker so that even after you have done the cryo uh, when you actually go ahead to place the buckle you have actually a mark on the sterile surface so that the buckle placement can be done at with without any hitch once the cryo is done we go ahead with the placement of the buckle as you can see over there this violet mark indicates the area where the break is we go ahead with ethibond sutures and the buckle is sutured tightly in place i always put in a 360 degree encerclage uh, using a 240 band uh, scleral tunnels are used to actually uh, fix the encircling 240 band and scleral tunnels are made in all the four quadrants all the three quadrants that is other than the buckle this is followed by passing the encerclage through the scleral tunnels or uh, through the groove of the buckle and the recti muscles it is then tightened using a watski sleeve 
Now there is a question which we get asked is how much to tighten. I'll be discussing it in a subsequent slide. We then go ahead with the SRF drainage. And it's always important to maintain pressure during the SRF drainage because that would prevent any subretinal hemorrhage. The uh, conjunctivitis then uh, sutured up, the muscles are, uh, the muscles isolation muscles are removed. And with that, we complete the surgery. Now, how much to shorten the band? Uh, for this, we have to go back to our school days. I will be reminded of our geometry classes when we used to study that circumference is basically twice pi r. So we are trying to reduce the circumference of the eye. So the new circumference will be twice pi r minus one if we desire an indentation of only one millimeter. So the idea here is that irrespective of the size of the globe, we the amount which we have to reduce does not depend on the initial size of the globe. So basically for indentation of uh, one millimeter, we go for uh, just twice pi, that is six millimeter of uh, shortening. For indentation of two millimeter, we go for a 12 millimeter shortening. So this patient did fairly well post-surgery. This was around two months after surgery. He had a visual acuity of 624. Now we go ahead and see the bucking procedure in an aphytic patient. So the process is basically the same. It's initial peritomy followed by isolation of muscle. Then we go ahead with the cryopexy. It's basically a very similar process, even for aphic patients. The explant is put in place and we have to make sure that the buckle actually covers the break. We use AT bond sutures. These are basically non-absorbable sutures, which will keep the buckle in place. The rest of the steps remaining the same. We go for a steel tunnel in the other quadrants and put in an encircling band. Now, uh, the interesting thing is even in an aphic patient, you can actually go for a drainage of the subretinal fluid. Once that is done, we evaluate the retina to see whether everything is in place and then the case is completed. This patient also did fairly well post-surgery and regained a vision of six by nine. Another thing which I have found very useful is using air injection, uh, especially after a very globe has become very soft. We try to put one bubble However, that was not the case in this particular patient. Eventually, I was able to get a single large bubble. So that provides some amount of tamponade. In case you are not going for a drainage procedure, uh, especially in a superior break and superior detachment, we can actually do a little bit of vitrectomy. This was a pseudophytic patient, as you can see. Uh, you use a cutter uh, through an MVR port to remove some amount of vitreous. The eye is softened. And then we go ahead with putting in an air bubble. So that will provide tamponade till the retina settles down. In this particular case, I did get a large single bubble. At the end, the port can be sutured off. Uh, these are a couple of cases. This is a patient with a fixed fold in one quadrant. Even though patient had a fixed fold, as you can see, the retina settled down very well with the steel and buckle. And the fixed fold actually remained on top of the buckle. These are a couple of other cases where a steel buckling did a very uh, great job. This is a pretty interesting case. As you can see, this is a fixed fold very close to the fovea and the patient had a large dialysis. I still went ahead with a steel buckling and after two weeks, the patient had a fairly attached retina, decent improvement in vision. And as you can see, the star fold was actually opening up. One interesting thing which I noted was this patient still had an open break. The break was on top of the buckle, but it was still open and the retina was still attached. So I went ahead and did a little bit of a barrage laser. A couple of months later, the star fold is almost gone completely. The break is still open. You can see the laser marks over here, but I was still not satisfied and did a row of further laser. So this is, there is a very interesting study done by Wong et al, which was published in Eye in 2018, which showed that even in cases where the break remains open, uh, after a steril buckle, the intraocular currents change and through Bernoulli's principle, the, that actually helps in drainage of the fluid from the break. So that leads to a attached retina, even when the break remains, break may remain open. So that's a very interesting thing. Okay, now pushing the boundaries of serial buckling. This was a very posterior break, as you can see, with a rolled out, rolled edge. 
uh, indicating some amount of PVR. Now, I still went ahead with the steril buckle, although the brake was not completely on the buckle, but it still remained attached and the patient improved, patient's visual activity improved quite a lot. So to summarize the results, uh, mean age of the patients was 47.4 years and single surgery primary retinal reattachment rate was pretty high, 94.5%. Four patients required uh, re-surgery, that is fast vena vitrectomy, and they had a successful retinal reattachment. There was a significant visual improvement in all the patients. Uh, one important thing to mention is that it's easier to fix a steril buckle failure, the fast vena vitrectomy failure, and even though considered less effective, scleral buckle can actually be pretty useful. Although one important thing is scleral buckling does induce significant myopia. And in our study, we had a myopia which ranged from minus three to minus five. Uh, there are certain advantages. Accommodation is preserved in young patients and in older patients, vitreous is preserved. There is no need for post-operative patient positioning, unless of course you are injecting some air inside. And surgery is also a lot cheaper than fast vena vitrectomy. So to conclude, it's a cheap, affordable, reliable option. Offers early visual recovery after a single surgery. And I believe it should be the first choice for all primary records in a certain attachment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, doctor, for your presentation. Now, can we invite the next uh, presentation, please? The next doctor for... Dr. Imadri, you need to unmute your mic. We are not able to hear. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Dr. Pavel, if you're ready with the presentation. Yes. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Yes, Dr. Great, great talk, Dr. Imadri. It was a very Thanks. interesting Thanks. and good, good study. We got a lot to learn. So I'll just share my screen. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes sir. Now it is visible. You can go full screen. All right. So, uh, why just stop at sterile buckling, conventional sterile buckling when you have uh, a chandelier available to you now? So, make it more interesting for yourself as well as for the patient. I'm sorry, there seems to be some problem, Dr. Weber. Uh, we are unable to hear you. I think Dr. Weber is facing some connection issues. Dr. Sethi? I have any relation, lack of training. And side by side, we are, the retractomy part has advanced. Uh, Dr. Baiva, if you are facing some technical issues, so what we can do is if you can resolve it, and meanwhile, we can go with the next presentation. Is that okay, Dr. Himadri? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Dr. Baiva, we seem to be facing some technical trouble. And uh, Dr. Avanish actually has another presentation after this. So maybe Dr. Avanish, if you're ready, we can have Dr. Avanish first. Dr. Avanish, if you're around. I am around. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I share my screen if, uh, or should we... Uh, uh, Dr. Weber, Dr. Weber uh, we are having some technical difficulties. Uh, we actually could not see your slides very well. Uh, so we are now going ahead with Dr. Avanish. Uh, Dr. Weber, please try to resolve your technical issue. We can then get back to your presentation. Is that fine? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. I think there is some technical issue. Yeah, uh, I don't we, know what's happening. Exactly. We were unable to uh, see your slides move and oh. you got muted for some time. Yes, yes. 
maybe in the meantime we can have dr avinish do his presentation uh, we can should I try once presentation. should I try once i think maybe it's better now yeah sure 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 we can try one more time sure thank you please share your screen then dr bhatta i cannot start video because the host has stopped it network issue bhi hai so sir main dobara karta hu network issue mera hai ya fir web pe events ki taraf se hai आपकी साइड से सर oh, इसलिए मैंने आपका वीडियो स्टॉप किया था थैंक यू वेरी मच अभी कैसा है नेटवर्क और इज बेटर नहीं सर लो है थोड़ा लो है मेरे पे मैसेज आ जाता है अच्छा चलो चलिए लेट्स होप फॉर द बेस्ट सिंस स्टफ ऑफ द स्वेल बकलिंग ओके सो नाउ इट्स बेटर यस यस योर वीडियो इज फाइन वीडियो इज फाइन इज विजिबल नाउ और नो नॉट येट Not yet. Yes, yes. We have your screen now. Yes. Clear. Okay. So. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. I'm going ahead. Sorry for the technical glitch. So why is it still making attractive lack of visualization, lack of skill transfer, and advanced or advancement is attractive? And the most uh, uh, the issue that comes up is that for VR surgeons, ergonomics is an issue in uh, over the years of practice. So. chandelier has a definite advantage over many folds the advantages are the visualization improves of each step the surgeon is able to do it better the trainee is able to learn better there is good skill transfer effective training and better ergonomics the neck and the back are spared so mystery is history after putting in the chandelier and jo dikhta hai wohi bikta hai as you all know surgeon can see and do better Assistant who is assist, assisting also understand what's happening. Previously, he was unaware what was happening. He was only getting shouted at. The trainees can learn better, and they understand. Oh, this is what cryo actually was, and this is what how this is how you do drainage. Lovely. The anesthetist also now starts enjoying and understanding what's going on. Previously, he's just busy on his mobile phone. It gives a direct non-inverted view of the retina, which is also very very comfortable for this operating surgeon. You don't have to go inverted vertically or laterally. Which happens in an IO or in an ophthalmoscopy, zoom and focus options will make the surgery even better because you can zoom in through the to the area of uh, uh, view and you can even focus it better. Ergonomics is a big issue in ophthalmology community, especially in VR surgeons. They are at high risk for developing musculoskeletal issues. I am quite sure all of our panelists have had some amount of pain in the back, and some have actually even had a slip disc. because of the awkward postures we attain in the orthoscopy during opd and or procedures puts maximum stress on your neck and your back and amongst a study done over a large cohort of surgeons 55% reported both back and neck pain both back and neck and out of the 7% actually had to undergo surgery for their back to relieve the symptoms can you believe that so nowadays in the era of virtual like we are having the virtual aios meeting this an era of e learning it's all about comfort everybody wants to do everything from home from their seat like we are giving the lecture so even a surgeon wants actually just to go through his notes in surgery.com before he does the surgery or uh, ophthalmologist or any surgeon wants to watch a number of youtube videos so that he improves his skill set because and problem with the conventional style of bucket is you cannot upload any your youtube videos because everything is dark but now the chandelier everybody learns and understand even a country away so our profession is a big pain in the back and study done by ramesh venkatesh and uh, colleagues in 2017 did short of 160 patients in surgical uh, 160 uh, doctors in surgical retina 114 had back pain and persistent back pain so already there's a lot of pain because of covid we don't want more pain in the back the era of 3d surgery has improved vitrectomy and vr surgery so why not do 3d chandelier cell buckle this is a short video demonstrating chandelier assisted buckling so conventional uh, steps as discussed by dr himanshu and dr animesh 360 conventional peritomy leaving a spill of limbal conventional tissue to spare the stem cells there do a nice amount of quadrant dissection open up the tenons in all four quadrants yeah and also same time you can also enjoy your chandelier music by see up so open up the quadrants tag the muscles 
be careful follow the anatomy make sure you're not tagging the obliques check each and every place yes so after proper dissection and proper clearance of the tenons all around tag all the four recti comfortably and very very important to after tagging the muscles to check because you you can land up with diplopia and other issues if you also tag in the obliques now place in the chandelier in this case i use the twin chandelier and this was a bullous detachment inferiorly and here you can see the those slightly uh, difficult in the recording slightly uh, the view is poor poor but uh, you can see a primary break here so the twin chandelier also gives you a much more dynamic broader field of illumination mark your break properly i prefer to do a skeletal tunnel before subretinal fluid drainage because it reduces the chances of uh, uh, tunneling in a hypotonus growth so prepare your skeletal tunnel pockets all three cases and now do the crucial step after marking and uh, place in your suture bites this i'm using a 50 dicron or you can also use etherbond as uh, very well described by himadri yeah take your sutures properly so the advantage here is at this particular step i have removed my chandelier and those are valved cannulas so i don't have any issues there will be no vitreous prolapse tighten your make a primary tightening of the suture and the advantage now is you don't have to keep shifting back and forth for your io uh, and putting your head gear on asking for the assistant or sister you don't have to do that after you tighten it the first time put in a chandelier back and after that get back see this so in this case actually the detachment did not settle with just this uh, the break was open so i went back and i did a subretinal fluid drainage with a precision gain needle and uh, i know i knew exactly where to do it at the height of the bullet detachment so i i should not uh, have any incarceration of vitreous of the retina so squeeze out from milk out the subretinal fluid from posterior to anterior milk it out nicely take your time till you see the pigments do it under the bed of the buckle to make it comfortable for yourself now tighten it again now you can see you can get a better indent you also happy that you might have good height now and it's a simple putting back and you can see the height is very good and there's a good amount of uh, buckle height and also you can make out the primary break here is this light fish mouthing here so these critical steps and this good visualization actually helps you to understand so it's very critical now to put in air which i did to settle down the primary break over the buckle height because the height is good but there was light fish mouthing so place in the air in the single uh, go yes and uh, then finally just close in the conventional manner and there you have it so additional surgical pearls place chandelier light 180 degree opposite to the break for maximum illumination you want good illumination because that's what you doing it for avoid excessive angulation and manipulation to prevent lens touch it hardly happens so don't worry about it we are experienced we are surgeon even if somebody is learning don't worry you will never indent so much or angulate so much you going to touch the equator of the lens because equator is actually you have to cross the equator of the globe to do that subretinal fluid drainage can be done under visualization also you can actually while visualizing it pass a needle in see the needles bore and drain out use valve cannula that's very very important because you can keep coming out otherwise the vitreous wick will come out and you can actually there have been uh, uh, issues in this the vitreous and then the retina incarcerates in your port you don't want that to happen mild vitreous prolapse can be seen so don't worry it can be prevented by reducing the intraocular pressure by the paracentesis before you do a port closure because the iop is high and you remove the port they can be vitreous wick come out if it comes out be sure cut the vitreous wick preferable is to do a suture and pass a suture through the port and special situations so in this case by shroff uh, uh, eye center and colleague by charu gupta and colleagues they have shown a very interesting case of steven johnson syndrome with a total corneal leukomatous opacity you see the kind of cornea that this patient has and they actually went ahead and did a sterile buckle the conventional technique would not have worked because the illumination and the visualization is coaxial and the problem would be the detachment here in the b scan has shown is a temporal one and the opacity the white opacity the leukomatous opacity is nasal 
So through the IO, it will not be visible. But if you do it through the chandelier, here you see, this is the intraoperative picture. There's a slight sub, uh, subluxated IO as well. See the scar that is there. But you see, you get a good view. And there's only temp isolated temporal detachment. And this is the primary break. This small area, which can nicely cryo and buckle up. So take OR message or take home message as we are all at home right now. Buckle up, light it on. Teach all your steps in 2D, 3D. And I'm quite sure 4D surgery is going to come through. And whenever you do a wrong step, the your chair might start vibrating. So you'll know that you're going to touch the wrong uh, part of the retina. Don't do that. And save your back and your neck. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Verma, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, as you mentioned, probably chandelier is the way to go for us in the future because otherwise people are giving up on steel walking. So probably chandelier will you know, keep them still at least practicing the art of steel walking, right? Yes, for sure. I think because it makes it more attractive and uh, you can post YouTube videos, you can do a lot of things and that, you know, that improves the awareness because young trainees, yes. some people don't even, are, are not even aware that cell buckle actually is a procedure that's as good as you've shown. You know, you can do it in all because the misnomer is that there's a rigid thought process, a young patient who we cannot uh, afford to lose the lens and a simple detachment only you should do a buckle. But as my mentor, Dr. Parmanja Kumarani Ma'am had taught us that she used to do stealth buckling in most of the cases, PVR grade A, even up to C, she was able to do it till there were fixed folds, she was able to operate and patient actually had a very, very good outcome. I was surprised myself, but it actually happened. And once it's attached, it's attached for life. Not like putting in the oil and then taking it out, then the retina comes off. So that, that vicious cycle is cancelled. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Weber. Uh, now we have Dr. Avanish with us. Uh, Dr. Avanish, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, Dr. Avanish will be talking about pediatric retinal taxes. Can I uh, ask one question to Dr. Vaibha? Uh, the placement of the chandelier, uh, do you always put it diagonally or do you try to put it in the same area as that of the uh, break? Because uh, sometimes putting diagonally a 180 degrees may not actually give you the entire set of holes which you may possibly would have missed, uh, which you can actually pick up on the same side if you can put the chandelier. So what are your thoughts? Dr. Uh, sorry to interrupt Dr. Upadhyay, but uh, we can keep the question answer sessions towards the end. So that you know we have proper ample time to do that. Right. I'll, I'll just answer this question. Uh, I normally use a twin chandelier, so that actually helps me because the other port you can actually make close to the break. So you know you have the advantage of having one diagonally opposite and one near the break. But what you're saying is right. It actually, is every case to case basis could work out 90 degree or 180 degree apart, whatever you're comfortable with. If you, the best part of chandelier is if you're not happy with the illumination, either increase it or you can switch the port very easily. So it's all self healing. Thank you. Thanks. So can we go with the next presentation, please? Yes. yes. Uh, is my uh, presentation visible? Yes, sir. It's visible and you can go on uh, full screen. Yeah. Yes. Good to go. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, AIOS and Dr. Hamadri, for making me a part of this session. I'll be speaking about scleral buckling in pediatric retinal detachments. I'm actually not able to somehow uh, uh, change the slide. The mouse click correct. Mouse. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So coming to the introduction, pediatric vitreoretinal surgery is different and it's very unique. One should be familiar with the anatomical and structural characteristics of the pediatric eye and with respect to its age. The visual outcomes in these patients are usually poorer because of long-standing uh, detachment or maybe they come up very late. And thirdly, even after good at anatomical detach uh, attachments, we kind of see uh, amblyopia. So, and post-surgical, what I have said that post-operator monitoring and visual rehabilitation is of paramount import importance. Uh, the characteristics of uh, pediatric retinal detachments is uh, they have usually macular involvement, which is seen up to 60 to 
five percent of the times they have a chronic course, as I said before, because the children are not aware of the detachments or the decrease in vision, and they are actually picked up during school screenings or maybe by picked up by by their parents when the patient is actually going into a uh, more of squinting. These patients actually have proliferative vitreo retinopathy at presentation, where it is almost seen in twenty to sixty percent of the patients. These kids actually have bilateral bilaterality with almost to 30%. And uh, that is what we had discussed in the previous talk also, that they can actually present with undetectable retinal holes. They are very difficult to actually examine. So we may miss out on holes and that can actually lead to uh, resurgeries and uh, re-detachments. Male have more preponderances and these patients do have some systemic comorbidities also. So some tips is like we should definitely ask for history of prematurity, presence of any infections before, uh, systemic involvement of any, and history of trauma, which is of uh, most important. If a child comes with history of squint, nystagmus, hypotony, or any cataract, we should consider that the child is possibly having PVR. Pediatric retinal detachments can be of all the three types, which we have discussed, uh, regmatogenous, tractional, and exudative types. We are going to talk about more about rigmatogenous types in this uh, presentation. Coming to pediatric rigmatogenous RD, here we actually have uh, the percentage is almost 5 to 8% of the total RDs of rigmatogenous, which we see. The most common causes are trauma, myopia, and uh, previous intraocular surgery is of an independent cause for these sort of uh, detachments. The previous surgeries could be a cataract surgery or a glaucoma surgery. And uh, uh, congenital development anomalies can be seen in almost 50 to 65% of the patients. Continuing with uh, uh, developmental uh, disorders, we have the stickler syndromes. What we need to understand is these sort of patients have bilateral rigmatogenous RDs in almost 50% of these uh, times. So when we are getting a child with uh, this stickler syndrome, we should uh, examine the other eye and we should do a prophylactic uh, laser 360 degrees if possible. If a patient comes with Marfan syndrome, uh, we should be aware of uh, thin sclera and where we should take into account whether we should actually go in for doing a buccal or vitrectomy. The others being FEVR and choroidal coloboma. So why to do a scleral buccal in pediatric patients and why not vitrectomy? The most common thing is uh, vitreous is more formed in these kids and it gives a good tamponade over the retinal breaks when the tractions are released by the buccal support and indentation. There are multiple studies which has put up that uh, we have a very good anato anatomical success in these sort of patients up to 90%, even if they have presence of PVR. And uh, we have seen that scleral buckling plus vitrectomy or maybe scleral buckle alone in these patients is better than vitrectomy alone. Secondly, if we actually try to go in for doing a vitrectomy in these kids, the, what happens is basically the there is difficult uh, separation of the hyaloid, which is... Uh, found out because of the tight adhesiveness of the vitroretinal junctions. And these hyaloids kind of contract and they lead to more PVR. Secondly, we are not able to actually uh, elevate the posterior hyaloid above the level of the anterior border of the break. That kind of the amount of vitreous kind of contracts and it can lead to reopening and re-detachments. And when we are actually doing a vitrectomy in kids, we actually have to do lensectomies, we have to do a retinectomies, and then again, we have to put in oil. So overall, the visual outcomes are very poor. Now, when ideally one should do a scleral buckle is basically when the uh, when we actually have a very clear lens, the breaks are mostly anterior, and there is usually no presence of PVR. The types of uh, buckling which we can do is encircling circumferential bands or maybe a segmental limited sub bands or maybe a radial buckle. I prefer doing a segmental limited circumferential buckle in most of my cases. So the principle of repair has been uh, nicely discussed by the previous uh, uh, speakers. And But what, what is of utmost importance is to examine the other eye when we are actually going in for the surgery of these patients. You can do it in the OR where you can actually examine the child under anesthesia, look in for any breaks, and you can do a subsequent laser and subsequent uh, follow-ups. Now, coming to the technique, what have been discussed before, what normally, ideally, you can do it in, in an older child or maybe 
like 15 years less than 12 to 15 years is like if when you put a buckle the the lateral extension should be 2 mm away from the brakes and at least the posterior should be 3 mm if you have an anterior brake the buckle extends from the aura and if you have a posterior brake at least 3 mm anterior clearance is required sometimes with the brakes we tend to have lot of retroretinal tractions and in that cases we can have an encerclage of what we use is 240 bands that can help in support coming to the width of the buckle uh, in younger children what at least should be done is like the the width of the buckle should extend from the aura to the posterior edge of the retinal brake uh, the the buckle should be precisely on the retinal brake that would actually help us in uh, having a good successful anatomical outcome and uh, these children may have later on possibly a vigorous reproliferation or a pvr so a higher or tight sort of a, a buckling is required so that we can have a, prevent from recurrences so this is one of the surgeries which i want to talk about this is a, a pre op case we can we can see that the child 13 year old child came with with a retinal detachment a high myope and we can see there was a flat srf and there were multiple breaks uh, seen in the 2 uh, to 3 clock hours and 4 to 5 which is not seen in the uh, in the photo but he had multiple lattices around 2 to 3 mm from the aura and we have went ahead and did a buckle uh, here in the video i i would want to explain that we did an inferior uh, drainage the the marking of the breaks and uh, cryo is not actually picked up in the video so we have drained the fluid as much as we can the end point is when there is some egress of uh, uh, pigments or maybe the blood starts to ooze out that is the end point and then we have done a temporary uh, uh, banding and then the a segmental buckle is used and we have uh, placed the buckle 276 buckle is used here which is an asymmetric buckle and we have the extent is almost uh, from uh, 12 o'clock to close to 6 o'clock and then we have uh, fastened the uh, uh, scleral buckle we have put the 240 uh, band over it and then we have tagged the muscles we have uh, done the tagging two uh, muscle tag has been done in the uh between the superior rectus and the lateral rectus and one tagging has been done in the uh inferior quadrant between the um, lateral rectus and the inferior rectus this is followed by a uh, tagging of the uh, 240 band and finally we do a uh anchoring sutures at supranasal quadrant and in most of these cases one should always do a paracentesis and uh, you, we can do that and this is how the result was this is another case which had a super temporal break following trauma which we can see that there is a good uh, uh, break uh, cryo marks and good retinal attachment now coming to some special circumstances of scleral buckling with vitrectomy that if you have a younger child who uh, infant who has a retinal detachment we can actually put a a 40 number band or a 240 silicon band that can be used and that bands are actually placed anterior to the equator uh, scleral belt loops of making sleeves for passing the uh, 240 band should be avoided better to do scleral uh, suturing uh, in rop related detachments the bands are basically placed to support the ridge the supporting uh, the anterior portion of the 240 band is basically supporting the ridge so the uh, the band is placed slightly more posterior and if you want to provide the height the sutures can be uh, imbricated in these patients coming to chandler uh, illumination dr baba uh, was nicely explained about it the, the rule of thumb is actually placing uh, when the child is more than 4 years of age it should be at least 4 mm in children less than 1 year i would prefer 1 to 1 to 1.5 2 years 2 mm and 3 years 3 to 3.5 so on and so forth and what uh, the advantage is what dr uh, weber was nicely explained about what we can what i was emphasizing is like the since the child the children are very difficult to examine we can actually identify uh, undetected breaks and that can actually help us in uh, in uh, identifying and having a proper uh, uh, attachment of the retina here you can see the cryo marks have been nicely been done and uh, the retina appears attached later on the disadvantages in pediatric patients would be clara is appears to be very thinned out 
So you do have to actually, when you take out the ports, whether it is 25, you should suture it to improve, uh, to avoid infective end off. If you use a 27th, it may, you may just get away with it. So post-operative complications could be limitation of eye growth for which you can divide the encircling bands after three months in children less than two years of age or those who have uh, eye growth, which is retarded. And the other most comp possible uh, complications is amblyopia for which a very good rehabilitation should be done. Just another slide to add for vitrectomy for pediatric retinal detachments. These are some indications, pure, poor fundus view, giant retinal tear, extensive PVR, and most commonly total retinal detachment with extensive RDs. Your primary uh, indication would be to do a vitrectomy. So to conclude, we should have a thorough history before the surgery where it should include a birth history, medical, family, and ocular surgery. There should be systematic examination. And uh, there should be extensive counseling about multiple surgeries and uh, even though you have good attachments for amblyopia. And finally, uh, you should uh, have excessive or uh, amblyopia therapy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. And I would acknowledge Dr. Dependar and Dr. Dibyansh for their videos. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor, for your presentation. Thanks a lot, Thanks a lot Dr. Avani. That was a wonderful presentation. We will now go ahead with the final uh, talk of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Devakant will be talking about why scale buckling has gone out of fashion. Dr. Mishra, could you please unmute yourself and turn on your camera, Dr. Mishra? Hi, good morning. Just a second. <laughs> Should we are earlier than uh, time? I'm, I'm unable to start my video. We had seen your video earlier. Yeah, now we can yeah. see. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much and a very good morning to everyone. And thank you, Dr. Hamadri, for this uh, wonderful opportunity and some really nice presentations. And uh, we have really seen the role of sterile buckling is still there in this era. But uh, let me uh, talk about why it has gone out of work. Uh, so this is the statement that Lister had made way back, almost 100 years back, that treatment of retinal detachments associated with retinal holes should be uh, only urged in only eyes as a last clutch at a straw of hope. So that was the situation way back. And at that time, and then scleral buckling came and it was the standard of care for a very long time. But now it has slowly receded a bit. So let us understand what, what are the enemies of the bucklers in the present day. So now we are living in the age of the sutureless. All surgeries we are trying to do without suture, the residents are Ex, uh, exposed less and less to sutures. And now we see uh, people have passed out, uh, passed their residency and they are unable to do sutures. So that gives a tendency to avoid uh, surgeries where sutures are involved. Uh, vitrectomy, the counterpart of uh, buckling, uh, the vitrectomy surgery has been the progressive one and has kept on evolving itself with latest technologies uh, cutting edge viewing systems and instrumental instruments are getting smaller and thinner day by day. So that is another advantage that we get. Where does it give us the advantage that buckling seems to be uh, having extensive tissue trauma and surgical handling and that uh, leads to delayed recovery in most of our cases. So uh, you can easily identify on the next post of which patient has undergone buckling and which has undergone a vitrectomy procedure, say 25 was vitrectomy. Uh, so intraoperatively, when we come to it, uh, we can see uh, we have the luxury of seeing complete attachment at the end of the surgery. So uh, that gives you a lot of confidence. On the other hand, in the buckling procedure, if there is a a lot of cases do attain attachment on table, but uh, uh, where the uh, SRF is thick, it is viscous, it might not settle 
or it might take a very long time. And that leads to delayed post-op recovery in some of the patients. Another challenge is uh, identifying all the breaks. So, I mean, we have talked about the indications of the surgery before, but uh, at times uh, the breaks are missed. And at, uh, if you happen to do a vitrectomy in that case, then that's a boon. So you can identify those breaks intraoperatively with proper indentation and then uh, uh, secure them easily. Another uh, important thing that we can do during the procedure when you are unable to settle or find the break is a drainage retinotomy. Uh, that advantage you don't have with the bucket. Uh, in similar cases where you cannot identify breaks or you are in doubt, you can always go for a 360 degree laser and that gives you the confidence and in select cases, one-eyed patients and cases we are not very sure about all the breaks, you can go ahead with that. So this advantage, again, buckling doesn't give us. And so complicated cases like these uh, would, would obviously opt for vitrectomy in such cases. Coming to the surgical time, uh, that's uh, questionable uh, because a lot of people who are very proficient with the art of scleral buckling uh, might be able to do that uh, uh, in a very less time, but uh, we tend to think that it will take longer time doing a, a buckle procedure and it might be more taxing to do that procedure compared to a vitrectomy procedure. Again, I don't know whether to call it as an advantage or a disadvantage, but if uh, a thorough pre-op evaluation is not possible due to some reason or uh, uh, just uh, the, the clinician is being lazy, uh, if it is not done properly, then buckling uh, should not be attempted or will be uh, will not give you the desired results. So in that case, uh, an easy way out is always a vitrectomy procedure. Uh, all procedures are uh, come with a long list of uh, complications, and so is with buck buckling. Uh, start with things like load perforation while placing the anchoring sutures, refractive changes, intrusion, extrusion, chances of uh, infection, ischemia, choroidal detachments. A lot of a long list of complications are there. Uh, I don't mean to uh, say that the, uh, the vitrectomy procedure is, has, doesn't have complications, but yeah, it, this also comes as a point. So those are my two cents. I would like to utilize the rest of the time if anybody wants to counter these arguments and uh, you know, the rest of the panel can chip in with their thoughts. Thanks a lot, Dr. Devakan. That was a really enlightening talk. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, if you can take them. Uh, yeah, Dr. Devakar, you have been working a lot, especially with young ophthalmologists all around the country. Uh, we have noted that uh, the training for serial buckling, especially uh, in the peripheral centers and centers where which are uh, not as big or as uh, uh, advanced, is pretty low. Uh, the exposure to scleral buckling, especially for the retina, younger retina fellows, uh, is actually almost non-existent in certain centers. So, what what would you uh, say about that, and whether there is any way we can actually, you know, help out to spread the message that uh, scleral buckling actually is still relevant, and you know, you actually need to learn about doing surgery. Right. So. Uh... I myself, during my training period, didn't get much exposure, unfortunately, to buckling. We tend to do a lot of vitrectomies, and later on, when you uh, you are young into practice, you realize that uh, uh, doing a surgery which you have not done uh, much or you're not very proficient with, so that that mental block is always there. And then you tend to either refer those cases or even worse, you know, a case which is a good for which is an ideal candidate for a buckle you go for a vitrectomy procedure and uh, you know so that's not a very ethical thing to do but again uh, uh, as we, you were saying that a lot of these institutes don't offer that amount of training or uh, more of vitrectomy is being preferred so the number one thing would be sessions like your I, the IC that you have conceptualized sessions like these which could actually tell uh, young surgeons what are the exact indications of buckling and it's not all that difficult at the end of the day. And more dialogue about this thing and the indications and at the end of the day, it has to come at the institutional level that these procedures should be incorporated and a certain amount of 
buckling procedures or rest of the procedures which are neglected should be part of the curriculum so that's more on an organizational basis that should be done but on our level um, we can of course keep doing sessions and try to propagate the word i had a question uh, to uh, the panel here uh, we are talking about institutions you know big institutions uh, where they still do learn cell buckling uh, what about private hospitals and uh, you know private setups or multi chain specialty hospitals would you give us some enlightenment on how are, what is the percentage of patients of primary rd who are actually undergoing buckle versus vitrectomy in, in super specialty i hospitals i mean just your experience dr avinash what is the answer to madhu right again uh, uh, you know that's uh, the answer is that it's very individual so Uh, like uh, dr avnish and i work in the same uh, corporate setup and he tends to do uh, more buckle procedures than me uh, so of course we must be getting we almost want, uh, work in the same demographics so i'm sure we'll be getting the same amount of cases but he is more proficient in buckling than me so he picks up uh, those cases more and again it's uh, it's a clinical decision that lies with the clinician at that point uh, dr avnish can give his inputs as well Yeah, thank you, Dr. Deva Khan, for those kind words. What I would understand is basically like doing a scleral buckling, buckling where uh, I trained in the place. He said it's like a drama. So what actually happens when you're doing a surgery is already set up with more. Uh, when you see a case with very typical, see, this is a particular case which would require a scleral buckle. So the entire thing is set in your brains that how you are, which what amount of buckle you're going to put it up. Uh, which buckle you are going to select where you are going to do a cryo and where you are going to go ahead so everything is just everything is planned and it's more of like you are just going for a play so what i understand is uh, for every young ophthalmologist which we have or younger retina surgeon he should be more into actually drawings which which is actually very much lacking as of now people don't do more of uh, drawings and all so going in doing drawings because that would actually help you to actually figure out where the vessel is going and your decision making will become actually more proficient secondly is buckling somewhere is actually a hurdle initially but once you actually are uh, doing if you have done one you get the idea actually to go ahead because the next day post ops are so encouraging that you just love it you know like once the retina as you said dr vaibhav once it's uh, it attached it is attached no matter what so then again i mean in private setups i, I would still feel it's 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 still very individual approach uh, it's up to the uh, what the corporate wants from you but at the end of the day it's your independent approach and if you are giving the best possible visual outcomes that should be a win win for everyone yeah thank you i think what uh, uh, dr mehru did you mean to ask about the commercial aspect of uh, doing a buckle in in that set of even dream but because now in the era everyone looks for reimbursements and finance that also is the back of the mind of uh, you know any any operating right. surgeon no because i have heard the conversation regarding a uh, buckling procedure not being that rewarding commercially uh, because always a vitrectomy would be charged more and you know more uh, procedures will follow uh, silicon oil removal or other things so that conversation i have heard but again as i said it's at the hand of the clinician and the organization doesn't have a role in that but yeah that thought might be there in some some minds so i feel uh, the idea that for a scleral buckle you should actually charge less uh, is probably not right because uh, you are actually doing a lot more work uh, it's probably more taxing on the surgeon Uh, rather than a vitrectomy probably materially even not using a uh, very expensive materials but uh, as a surgeon you are probably working as hard if not harder for a scleral buckle uh, rather than when you're going in for a vitrectomy so uh, if you look at the cost perspective if if you're charging the same amount for a retinal attachment uh, especially if you're looking at the commercial aspect of it if you charge the same amount for a retinal attachment surgery uh, scleral buckling is that actually more rewarding to you rather than uh, the other way around another thing that uh, as since we are talking uh, uh, about this about people young people picking up uh, buckle surgeries so from each of the panel can we have few tips for somebody uh, who wants to pick up uh, buckle and you know any tips from all of you that could probably 
uh, encourage others to pick that up. Uh, one thing which I have noticed is uh, vitrectomy surgery, it's very uh, not just uh, demanding and challenging, all that of course goes with any surgery. But, uh, you know, vitrectomy or a pasmina vitrectomy, it's very unforgiving is what I'd say. But uh, that's, that's very true for almost all retinal surgery, except probably steel buckling. Steel buckling actually, you know, even when the retina might not be attached in the very first day, over a period of time, you can actually be very surprised that the retina just, just gets attached over a period of time. The SRF drains off completely. Uh, and of course, you, since you're not disturbing the vitreous, if you do go in for a resurgery, the resurgery is also actually a lot easier than a plain vitrectomy or a primary vitrectomy. So I guess this is a thought process which we definitely need to inculcate in especially the younger uh, generation. And uh, I guess once a person has done even a single scleral buckle and gotten the results the very next day, which Dr. Avanish mentioned, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a process. You will continue doing the same thing because it's just like a cataract surgery. You do a single surgery, the next day the patient gets a very good vision and he's you know, set for life. You need not touch it one more time. You not, need not do anything else. I think for the young surgeons, uh, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, your overall, uh, you can't visualize it because chandelier has not been used very commonly. There's only few surgeons who are using it. Now the trend is increasing, I'm quite sure, but uh, because there are not much of YouTube videos, not much of e-learning happening. So even people who are, want to do it are not getting the proper channel of doing it. And maybe the, the tax on the back and the neck, we should also, as a surgeon, we should put an additional surcharge because we're going to be using our back and neck more than the VR surgery, bending in awkward position. So that also, you know, it's part of the whole process. You, your body also is a sacrifice that you're making over long term. Because those who end up doing most level buckle, the stress on the back and neck, as has shown, will be more. RP lasers and all these procedures tend to, you know, uh, have a more amount of uh, stress on these levels as well. Dr. Avnish, you are in. Uh, my thoughts would be actually a very simple case selection. If you are seeing a more anterior sort of a break, you tend to get uh, patients with uh, who are in their early teens who definitely have a retinal detachment. And if you actually are able to pick up those lattices or breaks where you know you know that this is a buckle, which you which is the primary indication. So once you have that, uh, I think that would actually take you places. I mean, I for 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 uh, for buckling. So case selection is of utmost important. Then going into more complex bullous RDs or maybe uh, having a lot of PBRs and all that, those are more secondary cases. But we definitely tend to see patients with uh, lattices with just uh, like not actually involving the macula sometimes where some people do a retinopexy. I mean, a pneumatic retinopexy, but even those cases are sometimes buckleable. So one can try actually doing a buckle and then if not uh, possible, then can go into a vitrectomy. So that would actually give a good idea as to when to go ahead uh, for, for those people, yeah. So that is another challenge that uh, I have faced that while counseling a patient and then you tell them that uh, chances of failure of the surgery is more with this procedure, they tend to go for vitrectomy if you, you know. So, that counseling part also convincing the patient at times and while explaining the procedure that also becomes a bit challenging with buckling. Do you feel that that way? In which I actually uh, tend to tell my patient is that I actually market it in a way that it's a less invasive procedure. We won't be entering inside the eye. We will be doing the surgery completely outside the eye. And if that succeeds, then you're set, set and you need not go for a second surgery. But if we go for a vitrectomy, then you probably will need a second surgery, obviously, because I will go on go in for an oil. oil. Uh, I usually do not go for gas uh, in most of my vitrectomies. If I'm going for a vitrectomy, you will definitely need a second surgery because I'll have to remove the oil. But if you go ahead with a steril buckling, then it will be a, a more less invasive procedure. And if it succeeds, you will just need this single surgery and no more. 
So my my patient responded to the same counseling was that if this, this surgery fails, then you are definitely going to do three surgeries. A total. So, so yeah. So I said go for vitrectomy. <laughs> Just one question to Dr. Hamadri. Uh, when do you actually want to do a buckle in those complex PVR with those intraretinal cysts, with the case which you showed the last? So what exactly? Did you drain it first and did a cryo or, or did you go and do a laser the next day? How did you kind of settle that uh, posterior uh, break which was there, which was very close to the, I think, almost around the equator or near, inside the equator, I think. Dr. Hamadri, you are not uh, audible. Uh, the break was very close to the macula, right? The last case. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, I actually did just a cryo in that case, but uh, I was very gentle about the cryo because I did not want the cryo to go too posterior and actually uh, infringe into the macula. And uh, I did do a SRF drainage. And uh, like I mentioned, the break actually was not completely on the buckle. It, it was not completely on the buckle. Actually, a part of it was on the buckle and a part of it was, you know, uh, uh, completely uh, unsupported. But uh, there are, you know, ways which buckling works and it actually got settled. So sometimes even scale buckling does surprise me. And I actually look for reasons for that. Why does the buckle, we all know that you have to at least close the brake, right? But a buckle can actually sometimes settle the retina even when the break is open. It's, it's yeah. something to do with Bernoulli's principle that uh, when the eye moves, the currents actually change because of the scleral buckle that is underneath the break. And that actually pushes the fluid, the subretinal fluid actually is pushed into the vitreous cavity rather than remaining uh, underneath the retina. And eventually, this very low amount of subretinal fluid gets absorbed by the RP itself. I think uh, even the vitreous also comes into picture where actually it kind of tamponades over the... Yes, area. yes, yes. Yeah, vitreous also plays a role yeah. if the vitreous is formed. Otherwise, uh, it's not working as well. A lot of patients with PVRs, uh, the inferior ones, where you actually kind of have a good indentation and a good buckle effect, there are still a lot of pockets of SRF which are still there. And over a period of three to six months, they kind of get absorbed. I yeah. have a couple of patients which I have seen, which I thought he, they, it would be very tricky to do a retinal surgery, I mean, do a vitrectomy. And they kind of settled very well with uh, scleral buckle. But then again, the SRF took at least like three to six months in that inferior, some pockets were there. That kind of, uh, but then again, it, you should have a very good intent over the buckle, I mean, the break. Once that is achieved, I think the, the other areas of SRF could uh, take its own course and go ahead. Yeah. I had a question uh, to the panel. In which cases would you actually go for a buckle after a vitrectomy? Once a vitrectomy is done, it's free. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a really interesting thing. Uh, I have done a couple of cases where I have buckled a silicon oil filled dye. So what happened was the patient uh, attached in the first, first case, but uh, after a couple of weeks, probably two or three weeks, a new break appeared, which, which kind of led to a redetachment under oil. So since it was just one single break and I could actually identify that this break was causing the re-detachment, I decided instead of going in for a re-vitrectomy, let me just try with a uh, scleral buckle with the oil inside. What, what one important thing you need to do is uh, you need to remove some of the oil using a separate MDR port to make the eye slightly soft so that actually it can accommodate the buckle. And the rest of the process is same. You do a cryo with the oil inside, put the buckle, and then suture it off. You can actually do a subretinal fluid drainage as well. So rest of the process is same, but you can actually do a sterile buckle even with oil inside. So did you ever have to do a buckle? I mean, you started doing a vitrectomy and you realized that you need a band, a support like that. So did you guys happen to do that? started with vitrectomy and then gave an additional band. I haven't done uh, anything like that, but uh, I did feel that probably this patient uh, will need a band later on when we reattach. So, uh, you know, you get this feeling, right? When you have settled the retina, everything's fine, but you know, you know that this small break, you know, might not actually stay in place. 
So that did happen, and I had to do a secondary buckle along with the hemiprectomy uh, in the second surgery. Because it's very challenging to do otherwise. Yes, yes, yes. I did it once in one case where I think the traction was not released, especially in fetal traction after the vitrectomy. What about, uh, yeah. what yes. about doing a refashioning of your buckling where you have actually done a buckle and uh, you see that the, as you have mentioned, that there was one area where the buckle was not actually hinging on to the uh, brake and it is like slightly anterior. So have you gone in and pushed the buckle or had a, have you put, put another uh, set of, uh, I mean, the buckle, uh, have you done anything different or maybe done some refashioning? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Babu was trying to make a point. I think we can cover that and then move to that. Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, so, sorry. So, the, basically, that particular case, what saved me was I had bad reports because uh, so I was very slow, but it was difficult with the hypertomy already in the eye and already retractomized. And uh, so, I had a tough time doing it, but uh, somehow managed. But then I realized that maybe it's better to do it at a second sitting. Than doing it straight away and drop it again. But this question by Dr. Avdish is a, is a good question. And my question is to the panel itself. My uh, query is a lot of people abroad, I mean, outside India, tend to use the sponge than the uh, you know, silicon element that gives a better indent. I see a lot of Egyptian doctors, as well as surgeons like Dr. Barbara Parabini, they tend to use the uh, sponge also. Though we have been taught that you know it has a more chance of exposure and you know seeding of uh, infection also, secondary infection can happen. However, they prefer to use uh, the sponge versus the silicon tile. Any thought process why that happens? Is it easier to do? I I do not have uh, any experience using a sponge. But what I have been told by uh, by seniors is that because sponge have tend to have a higher rate of infection, tend to have a higher rate of uh, buccal infection. Uh, usually, sponge is not preferred. Probably something to do with the climate in India, where uh, it's considered that uh, chances of infection are anyways higher than in the Western countries. Maybe a better grade of sponge is available there than here. The uh, company making I'm, the I'm not aware. Company. I'm not aware. No Davinish, your comments. I actually I have not done more of like using a sponge, rather I've done extrusion of those sponges after infections. That I think everyone of us would have done that. So that actually gives an implication that, you know, maybe it kind of thins out or maybe somehow this scleral buckles, what we use silicon or the silicon base, they are more uh, better. The sponges definitely uh, they have extrusions. Have like I've removed two three during my uh, fellowship times. So I I don't have a personal experience of actually using a sponge, but definitely extruding it out I have done that. Uh, thanks a lot to all my panelists. Uh, this was a really interesting session, uh, although very thinly attended. But uh, we had a really good time. We have learned a lot, and we really thank uh, AIO Scientific Committee for giving us this opportunity. Again, thanks again to Dr. Weber, Dr. Avanish, Dr. Diva Khan. Uh, Dr. Animesh had to leave earlier because of uh, some uh, OR issues. So thanks again, and we had a great session here. Thank you very much.